um, yeah, Marion, take it away. Cool. So I was going to say, good evening, how are we all? But obviously you can't answer me, so just <laughs> I'll assume you that you're all well because you're with us this evening. And you can hopefully uh -huh. also see <laughs> Roy Kennedy. Yeah, I can see some thumbs appearing. Uh, Lord Roy Kennedy, I should say, actually. He's kindly agreed to join us this evening. And we're just going to have a conversation with the basis of a simple question, which is what's next for the Labour Party? So to get started, I'm going to ask Roy if he can just kind of introduce himself to those who don't know Roy already. Roy, do you want to take it away? Tell us a bit about who you are, what you do, what you've, what you've been up to. Fine. Thank you, uh, Marion. And can I thank you and I thank Adam and all the uh, young Fabians for putting this uh, series of events on. I've, uh, I hadn't come across Zoom, to be absolutely honest, two weeks ago. This is now my fourth Zoom event today. And we just had a Labour Lords peers meeting with sort of like 70 odd um, Labour peers on. So, but thank you so much. And as usual, the um, young Fabians are at the forefront of uh, getting debate, discussion and moving things forward in the, in the Fabian side and also in the Labour movement. So thank you very, very much for that. Um, I'm obviously very proud to be a member of the Fabian Society. I'm also proud to be a member of the executive and to be the national treasurer. And that's a... Uh, so I was elected to uh, a few months ago. Just a little bit about myself. I'm a Labour and Co-op member of the uh, House of Lords. Uh, I've been in the House of Lords now, it'll be 10 years in May. It's gone very quickly. And well, how did I get there? Well, I've been a member of the Labour Party. I know, I know I don't look it. I've been a member 42 years. So I joined when I was 15. So I'm 57 now, but I'm 42 years been a member and it was one of the best things I ever did. I've met some great friends, uh, great people and I've been able to play a proper role in the party. For 20 of those years I was a member of the Labour Party staff uh, and I had a variety of roles. started off as an organiser working in uh, Gravesend in Kent and then I've ended up um, being the regional director in the East Midlands and then for my last five years I was the director of finance and compliance based at a head office in Victoria Street. And that again was a very different role as I was very proud of. And when we lost the general election in 2010, uh, Gordon Brown uh, put me in the House of Lords in his sort of like a dissolution honours list. And I was very surprised and very honoured to be there. And I've, I've tried to then in my last 10 years to stand up for what I believe in, what I believe are, are labour values and make the case for uh, fairness and social justice in the House of Lords. And that's why I got there and I'm happy to answer any other questions in a moment on anything about my background and stuff. If I move on Marion and try and answer the question you pose, which is, where do we go from here? Well, I think it's fair to say that's a very, very big and broad question. And I think in any attempt to answer that sort of question, I think you have to set out, um, well, where, where have we been and where have we got to? And we're also in some of the most unusual circumstances in our entire lives. We have this um, global pandemic of COVID-19. There's been nothing like it in our lifetimes. Comparisons have been made to the Spanish flu pandemic. In the, in the, it lasted from January 1918 until December 1920. And that was, uh, you know, a, a deadly pandemic, pandemic, the worst in, in human history. And that resulted in, in, in effectively a quarter of the planet, 500 million people being affected, and over 17 million deaths. So it's a huge, huge problem. We could be in something similar, but we'll obviously work in sure that isn't the case. So I think in that, in that context, the Labour Party, the Labour Party in Parliament, has to provide constructive positive opposition to the government and we need to be we need to be saying when the government is getting it right well done government you've got it right and be very honest about that but also be very clear where we think they need to go further where we think they need to do more or where we think they need to go so we're offering that uh, important labor opinion that important labor road route mapping that important labor guidance for the government and i think when the pandemic's over and it will come to an end, that is the time then for us all to sit down with cool heads to look at what happened, how do we get here, 
what was the response of government at the time and what are the lessons to be learned and that's to be done frankly, after the pandemic so it's not for now for now it is constructive positive opposition to help the whole country fight this uh, terrible disease and move on to the future now that's our labor response to the pandemic now moving on to labor party itself well obviously on saturday at 10 45 we're going to get the announcement of who the new leader of the Labour Party is. You want three people, Keir Starmer, Lisa Nandy, or Rebecca Long-Bailey. Uh, I voted for uh, Keir Starmer and I hope that Keir wins and I'll be looking out for the announcement and will be on, um, on Saturday. I think it's fair to say no Labour leader will have come into such circumstances ever before. There'll, there'll be no honeymoon. They've got to hit the ground running. And they've got to obviously deal with the issue of the pandemic first of all but also that is also mapped i think in the in the context that on december the 12th last year we suffered the worst general election defeat for the labor party since 1935 and it's actually worse than that because if you look at just wales it is the worst defeat for the Labour party in wales since before the general strike of 1926. This is, this is a catastrophic defeat. In the opinion polls today, the Tory party is polling 54% and Labour is on 28%. That's a 26 point lead for the government. So that just mirrors, sets out where we are. Let's be absolutely clear. We were utterly rejected by the electorate on December the 12th. There's no other who can be drawn. Uh, we lost 60 seats in Parliament. Our vote share fell by 7.9% down to 32.1% of the of share of the vote. We only have 202 Labour MPs. And that really in itself is a shocking, shocking for us all. But I think we also need to contextualise that in um. The last four years for the Labour Party have been very, very difficult. Um, and I believe that when you look at what happened to the party in the last four years, I believe we lost sight of the prize. And for me, the prize always is being able to return a Labour government uh, because and actually deliver that positive change that we saw in the 1960s, Harrible, some we saw in 97 with Tony Blair and actually make people's lives better. Working people, people living on council estates, people living on, uh, you know, on low incomes and actually making their lives better. And that's the prize for us. Um, there's no one, I don't think there's only one thing you can point to the cost of the election. I think, frankly, it's a number of things. The manifesto um, uh, certainly contributed to that defeat. Um, I don't think it was by any means the sort of panacea that people suggested it was. It contributed to the defeat. I think the anti-Semitism problem contributed to the defeat as well. We, we, we have seen as a party that would not get a grip with what we've got of racism in our party. And we were not prepared for the election on any level whatsoever. I have been a, an official for the party and I know what being prepared for the election means. For me as an organiser, it means that you have your election leaflets printed and the day the election is called, you're out delivering your first interactive leaflet, you're doing your street stalls, you're getting your message out on Facebook and you're off to, get, off to go. We were nowhere near that. And um, we also had to have a, a staff team that's absolutely trained and all our volunteers trained. And we completely um, failed to do that. I also believe we got into this ridiculous situation where we would not believe what we were being told. The polls told us we were going to get a hiding. We some people would just not believe that, would not believe that. The there was a belief the all levels of the media were against us, and to the point we had ridiculous suggestions and believing all sorts of nonsense. And we almost got to the point, I, I almost suggested it was like, almost like the Emperor's new clothes, that we were right and everybody else is wrong, and we were going to win despite that. I think again, all of those things coming together create a toxic mix that means you cannot win an election. So where do I think we go from here? Well, if I maybe come up with four or five suggestions what we need to do, mine are going to be all going to be 
focused internally on the party, you know, but I also know that the new leader has to lead a national conversation with the country, has to find leadership in this global pandemic, and needs to work with the shadow cabinet to do that. But I believe that we have to rebuild our organisation from top to bottom. There are problems at every level. Um, I'm absolutely clear that the community organising model has been an absolutely disastrous failed experiment and needs to be brought to an end as soon as possible. It achieved absolutely nothing that needs to go. I also think that um, we have to become the campaigning party we once were. Uh, I think we've lost our edge on campaigning. I, I, we could not be more unprepared for the general election in 2019. Couldn't be more unprepared for the general election. We had um, at every level materials not available, uh, materials arriving late, uh, unclear messaging, and just not being focused. So we need to get our campaigning uh, edge back. One time we were a feared campaigning party in the country. We're no longer that. We need to get that back. I think we also have to unite as a party and. And actually, we do want to unite our party, and there's great people in all parts of the party, unite and refocus what we're doing. We all know, we all often say that divided parties don't win. That's absolutely true. We've all got a responsibility to unite, to actually win and deliver the people that need a Labour government. I also think we need a much more constructive relationship with our trade unions. It must be one about partnership with all our trade unions, all our affiliates, not about one trade union dominating that relationship at every level. That can no longer continue. Um, I also think it means we have to have proper policy development. And I think this is particularly where the Fabian Society can come in. I also think the young Fabians, and I've said before, uh, the members of the young Fabians, you are the future of our party and of our movement, where we get that radical thinking coming forward with actual proper solutions that the problems are going to face in the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And the problems are going to face uh, going forward are going to be very different than the problems we thought we faced, maybe even only, only about phase three or four months ago. So huge problems there. So I think a lot of positive on there. And I also think we've got to face up to the fact that we're going to get a judgment from the Equality and Human Rights Commission uh, fairly shortly. We're in the, only the second party in history of, the, of this body to be referred to them, the investigation. The first was the BNP. How shameful is that? And we have to be very clear that before that judgment comes, we're going to work to repair the damage done, to repair the, the uh, work, we repair our relationship with the Jewish community, and we're going to implement every single recommendation that comes forth in that report quickly and properly and get ourselves back onto the right, onto, onto the right keel there. And they're the things I think we need to do as a minimum to get ourselves back on the pitch. I think the problem in 2010, sorry, 2019 was we weren't actually on the pitch and we need to become a contender again. So I think doing those internal things are the way we start to get ourselves back as a contender, start to get ourselves back as, as, as a party that the country will begin to listen to. Only by being listened to as a party will, will we begin to earn the trust that, that was, that's inevitable, that's needed for them to actually trust us with the government of our country. So I'll leave it there, uh, Mary and Adam. Maybe I'll take any questions that you want to ask me. Thank you. Thank you. That's really, really interesting. I see we've got one question already coming. Um, how do I? <laughs> Adam, do you want to help me <laughs> indicate? <laughs> there we are. Hi, yeah. Uh, do you want to give us your question? Hello, good evening. My name's Sanchia Alassia from East London. Um, what I wanted to ask um, Lord Kennedy was, over the election period, or given, albeit a short election period, we did have a lot of activists on the ground, and that is something that the Labour Party is known for. They're known for the Labour doorstep and get it, getting activists out on the ground. So given that we did have those numbers of activists, certainly in a lot of the London seats. Um, what does he think um, went wrong? We were knocking on those doors, we were talking to, to people, but, you know, obviously we didn't get those 
votes in. So were our activists in the right places at the right time? Thank you. Well, I think on yes, we certainly did in London and the South East have lots of activists on the ground. Our party membership is kind of skewed a little bit in that the bulk of our members are in London, the South East. When you get to the Midlands, the North, the North East, we have much fewer members. So there are many instances around the country where we had marginal seats that didn't have the huge crowds of members I saw going out in London campaigning. So it wasn't everywhere. I think that having members out is great, but I think it's only one part of the plan. You can have members out, but we didn't have a message. The message was confused, it wasn't clear, and that contributed because people get them, people hear from the party, you know, through the media, through leaflets, through knocking on doors, through debates, and they get it, you know, for all sorts of different mediums. And we, for me, we didn't have a clear, coherent, consistent message. And I think we need to have that. And that then, if you got that message right, then I think that the actives on the ground give you the edge. But unfortunately, I don't believe that the party at the centre was giving uh, the membership uh, the, the message or giving the country the message you wanted to hear, in which case then I don't believe that the activists themselves could actually um, turn, turn, turn so many of those seats into actual victories. That's not, and the Chris and the members, they couldn't do anything about that. It was the, the, the failure to deliver the message at the centre was the problem. Okay, and we've got a question from Adam next. Hi, Roy. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, you know, in the last five years, we've seen the party change quite dramatically in its members and uh, in how it's run and, you know, uh, at all, all levels, like, like you said. Um, you talk about the whole the, the need for wholesale reform. Um, you think, though, the party itself has, all, has undergone another change thanks to, thanks to Brexit and the attraction of Keir to many Remain-focused uh, people in, uh, in the UK? The membership changed dramatically in 2015, and over the last two years, it, it has dramatically changed again. Um, when it comes to extra organisations that we've have uh, seen emerge, Momentum being one of them, there's lots of good things about Momentum. The great organisers, the great innovators, the good tech. They've got some brilliant people involved in it. Um, obviously, we've seen Militant in the 80s uh, and ha and the toxic effect they had. Um, would you say that um, uh, moment, momentum is similar or very different to the old militant? And what do you think uh, the future for momentum could look like? Well, I, um, I, th I don't know what other colleagues have had in their own their own experiences, but it, I mean, I, I'm a member in the Labour Party in Lewisham in South London. I've been a member. I, in my 42 years membership, I've, I've been a member of um, four different constituency Labour parties and I've been members of the party in good times and not so good times. Um, but I think it's fair to say that in the last four years, they, I've, I've attended some of the worst meetings I've ever attended in my entire membership. And I, and I don't mean worse in the sense of um, policy disagreements, I mean worse in just been unpleasant to be at the meetings, you know, and I, and I think that's the worst thing about it we've had in the last few years. I don't mind having a friendly discussion about anybody on policy, not an issue of me whatsoever. I've got friends in a party that um, are more left with me, that are more right-wing than me, not an issue whatsoever. But, you know, but uh, I think what's so frustrating is that the level of, of unpleasantness at meetings that I've witnessed, and I think we we probably, I've seen a few nodding heads in front of me, we probably all witnessed um, at the Labour, and that's the worst thing, that we cannot actually, as a group of friends and comrades, or people who potentially got very similar views, can't sit down together and discuss things, how possibly can we convince the country that we're fit to lead the country and provide leadership? So that's the worst thing. Uh, yes, Momentum. I, 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 um, I've, I've met many Momentum members. They, as you said, there's some really great members of Momentum. They have brought innovation and campaigning to the party. They're usually very young, they're enthusiastic, and I think that's all really good. And what we need to do, I think, is, is harness that energy, that enthusiasm, that, that wanting to actually um, to campaign and develop in a really positive way. Um, but what we can't have equally at the same time, though, I saw a thing recently, you know, 
what we can't have is is dictates and instructions from men from coming out to Labour councillors or other members of the party or running slates and things, other things. So I think it's energy campaigning. Uh, and there was some really good work I saw done actually in the 2017 election with some of the stuff on social media that was really innovative for momentum. But uh, we, we, I think we lost our, our, lost our sort of uh, thing, uh, our zeal a bit in the last election. And we can't have this sort of like um, party within a party, you know, in terms of trying to stitch up selections and um, deselect people and stuff. So I think that's a real big problem. So I think lots of good things we want to enhance and develop, but also we also, also got to recognise that some of the bad stuff that's happened in the last four years has got to be put into the dustbin and not seen again. So it's a balance on those things. Keep the good, but equally, we want to have a party that's open, that's friendly, and um, we want everyone to be part of it, but on the basis that we're all equals working together for the common good. I agree. <laughs> um, our next question is from Milad. They're coming thick and fast this evening. You'll be glad to know. All right. Right, Milad, do you want to take it away? Let me unmute you. There you are. Thank you. Thank you all. Hi, Roy. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hope everyone's well. Um, I just wanted to first make a comment about the last election. Um, I, I, I'm a caseworker for an MP and a, a Labour West London MP, and sort of my job is to um, obviously kind of serve constituents and help them out and offer advice and to sort, solve their problems. And I was really astonished that the link between helping people and their voting intention didn't really translate for us this time round. I mean, I remember knocking on someone's door that I'd been helping for a very, very long time. And and they sort of said, no, no, they're going to go for Boris. And I, and, I, and I sort of thought, well, hang on, we've been helping you out all of this time through Parliament. Um, and they said, yes, but you helped me out on a local issue um, when my Conservative councillors didn't help me and ignored me. But, uh, but I'm not going to vote for you in the general. And I, and I just thought we need to sort of um, find a way really to um, correlate casework, which a lot of Labour MPs do for their constituents, and try to convert that into votes as much as we can. So there might be sort of ways we could speak to our uh, members in the House of Commons or potential candidates to see how we can improve that. Um, but moving on to my question, I mean, moving forward, um, the whole coronavirus situation um, has meant that a lot of industry, a lot of jobs ha have gone I know the creative industry, you know, people's livelihoods are falling apart. And I just wondered, Roy, what your thoughts would be on how the new Labour leader should approach that and how we could champion the values of, of Labour in a, in a very different setting, not industry as such, but, but in creative industry, and sort of drive that forward so we can sort of win support of all of these people. Thank you. Sorry for the drawn out uh, comment no, no, and question. I, uh, I'm, you know, thank you for that. I think... Um, your first point you made about, you know, the work you've done locally, not correlating then to actually support the general election, for me, that highlights the problem we've got in that voters can often be very grateful to the local member of parliament, the local councillor, uh, for the work they're doing to help. And generally very grateful and very thankful for the work that they're doing for them. And I think lots of Labour MPs do really, really good case work but they're not translating that in actually going out and voting for the ballot box. And why should they? they don't they don't have to? And I think for me, it highlights you know the complete absence of a believable policy narrative at the centre, and that people looked at what we were offering and they didn't believe it, they didn't like it, they just thought it was just not credible. So and I suspect in many cases, that people at the end of the day, they walk down to the polling station, that's what they're gonna vote for, you know, and that you know. If I think I'm right in saying that, I think I'm right in terms of um, where we are. Um, we um, offered, um, I think you're right, the public spending we were offering, the increased public spending we offered in 2017 was an additional £70 billion pounds of public spending, 2017, right? In 2019, that had gone up to £135 billion. Pounds. We added on £65 billion pounds in two years and I don't believe that offering uh, offering the renationalization of you know a lot of utilities made one but damn bit of difference to people and put it put a pound on anyone's pocket and I think that would that did they offered nothing I think the free broadband offer went through the was, was the game was seems ridiculous so I think the problem we've got in the election was is no matter what local members members were doing 
that the, the, the wider offer um, wasn't convincing and many people then didn't vote for us. And that's why so many great Labour MPs lost their seats. Uh, we lost 60 Labour MPs. Some of them are dear, dear friends. And I think it's because of the point you highlighted that I thought they weren't, weren't convinced that what we were offering or what we were offering would do more damage than good. That's why they're there. In terms of um, your second point about COVID-19 and, and, and we are going to come out of this, I think we're going to come out into a very, very different world, that's for sure. Uh, and I think it was said in the banking crisis, it will never be the same again. But unfortunately, very quickly it became the same again, didn't it, unfortunately? But I do think that uh, on the back of this pandemic, on the back of the huge increase in public spending, uh, the huge uh, work in terms of volunteering, of people coming together, the really great work being done by the health service and health professionals, we almost need a, we need ideally, and Labour needs to lead this, I think, we almost need, need like a new beverage report, a new beverage settlement. And we often talk about the, the post-war settlement, don't we? That settlement that was, came out of the Second World War and largely was respected by part, both parties in government right up to 1979. So I think what we need to do is, you know, realise that actually, you know, we, we do need community, we do need to come together. The, the, this um, this um, pandemic, this disease doesn't respect borders, doesn't respect what colour your passport is, or doesn't respect institutions. You can be young and old, you can be rich or poor, and if you get this, you can be very, very ill. If you're very unlucky, you can die from it. And I think we understand that we all need to come together. In an, and I think Labour should lead this in a, in a new coming together of our country, a new post-war, a new sort of settlement like the post-war settlement that actually will then develop policy, how we all can come together and a much bigger role for public services and also a much bigger role for, I think we've seen the last few days, haven't we? You know. How, how much we rely on the local, not only the health service, also how we rely on the local authority. You know, the, the people come pick up your rubbish, you know, the refuge collectors, the care workers who are looking after old and vulnerable people. These people often don't get paid uh, a great way. Well, that needs to change. And actually we understand that care workers are doing a valuable job in our community. They need to be paid for much, much more. And that the world we, we want to live in in the future had to respect people much, much more and actually deliver people on those very important social services that haven't unfortunately seen people rewarded they should be. So hopefully out of that, as we get this new settlement, um, we can all move forward on that basis. It's very interesting. I particularly like your point about how things are going to change. Um, one question I wanted to ask myself is how do you kind of see the policy process? working between Conservatives and Labour because you could almost say that the Conservatives have kind of taken some of Labour's ground almost in the past, I mean, few days? <laughs> it's, not, it's not even been that long really. Some of the policies that the Chancellor has announced, you know, a few weeks ago we would have thought, what? A Conservative government wouldn't do that. So where does that leave Labour? You know, will people say, well, the Conservative government looked after me, why, why should I vote Labour? What, um, what would be your response to that? I think that, um, you know, I think at the point I made the start about being a constructive opposition and where the government got it right, we have to I say, well done government, you, you know, Boris Johnson, Rishi Shunak, you've got it right and we support you for that. And, and if, if, they, if they are delivering policies, that we have suggested in the past or come forward, well, that's all well and good. Um, I think we have to be, a, in that sense, be a positive opposition, uh, but equally, well, we think they need to go further. And I think I was very pleased to see the, the calls from, from, from the Labour Party, you know, from the front bench and from elsewhere in Parliament and in the party for the support that was needed for the um, self-employed sector in this country. And we then finally saw the uh, government come forward there. So I think well, we can offer solutions. We should do that and continue to do that. Um, I think there is a, a, a really positive role for a, a modern Labour Party that is putting forward policies that are going to take us forward. And when we come out of this pandemic, as I said, the, the public expenditure bill is enormous. There'll be a public debt that will have to be paid back over a long period of time. And we need to be coming forward saying, how do we address that? And also, as a point I made earlier, 
we've we've seen now so readily how we are all part of one big community how we all need each other so i think i'd hope to see the new labor leader the new labor party talking about yes respect for people and stuff respect for those um, care workers for the people working shops the low paid workers I haven't always had the respect and actually we need them and they're a vital part of our community so i want to see policies that really look at that and we've talked before this pandemic we talked didn't we about um about social care how important it was well i think we're seeing it now how vitally important it is and that how people need to be protected and looked after so i'd hope that the labor party be able to will be able to direct um the debate in, in future years that's why i made the point about how important the fabians are because i do think that the fabian side in particular can help the labor party in terms of doing the thinking over the next few years so because we need to develop a manifesto over the next three or four years that will actually provide solutions to the problems that we're going to be grappling with now for the next 30 or 40 years okay next up we have a question from martin hello, martin, hello. Yeah. Hello, Roy. Good to see you. Good to see you. Yeah. My my question is around your point about what Labour should do post the leadership election and around the COVID nineteen response. You made a really good point about pushing for a new brev beverage report yeah. and in effect talking about how we remake our society. A lot of of our response will be dependent on the decisions that the new leader makes um, in the next few weeks. I wanted to get your views on what the main priorities for the new leadership will be and what are the key things you think they should be doing in terms of our COVID-19 response? Thanks. Yeah, well, I think the first we have to have is the new leader needs to appoint a um shadow cabinet and maybe have a have a sort of like smaller group inside their shadow cabinet that's going to be leading on our COVID-19 response and I think as I said we have to be able to offer support where it's where it's where it's needed to the government and also then offer constructive criticism constructive work with the government to take us forward gets over this period of the next few months and um, and then beyond that then begin to sort of develop our, our policy in response to that uh, what we cannot do we must always must not do is fall into the trap of being negative and difficult with the government people don't want to hear that they want uh, they want our government to succeed they want our government to beat this virus they want its government to do that and they want to see an opposition who's equally determined to beat the virus so i think it's really important that the leader gives us that leadership but in that then is where we believe the government should do more as we sh as we showed in terms of self-employed people we should push for more most of the measures announced by the government, of course, are now for only for three months. And um, I, you'll know better than me, Martin, I suspect you know, this, can, this disease will be with us for much longer than the next three months. And we need to have a much longer term response to that. So yes, so I think we need constructive support for the government. A, a shadow cabinet is offering that leadership to, to the party and to the country. And then also then laying the foundations for a, a new beverage type settlement I also suspect that there'll be a um, some sort of inquiry after the event, which there, there always would be. I was listening to or hearing the discussion recently that what's well, gone got on New Zealand, and that, as you know, there in New Zealand, the uh, they've set up a select committee of the entire parliament there, under the chairman under the chairmanship of the leader of the opposition. And I think that's that may be something we could do here. Maybe that we should suggest to the government that. Maybe there should be a select committee uh, so we can actually uh, bring people together to look at positively how we can actually move ourselves forward. And I thought maybe handing out the role to the new leader might be a good thing to do. I certainly want to explore that as an option. Um, in Parliament, we're going to be coming back um, on the 21st of April. We'll have been away for nearly four weeks and we uh, need to uh, very quickly get um, into uh, question the government again. And I know that in the Lords, we are pressing the government even now to be able to find ways that members of both houses can question the government even during the recess. And we suggested there could be events like this, where members of a house can come on and question ministers and um, ask them points and get them to tell us what's going on. Because I do think the more scrutiny the government gets actually helps the government 
it's not about being difficult it's actually about enabling them to actually tell us what's going on how to move forward but as i said maybe that new a committee based on what they're doing in new zealand's way forward and after a proper inquiry and hopefully out of that a new beverage settlement is the way forward for our country Sounds good. And um, next we have a question from James. Yeah, hi, hi, Roy. Um, thanks for giving a good time this evening. Um, yeah, I'm just kind of curious because I was in. I'm, I live in Islington North, and we had a sort of a meeting of sort of some of the um, sort of chairs and board secretaries last night, and there was there was a fair bit of anxiety from some of the more left wing chairs about sort of their future in the party, and obviously, you know, the left has been firmly in control the last sort of four or five years, and you know, they've sort of had, had their go, as it were, but they're obviously, they were like worried about the future and would they stick around if, if you know, they got a leader that they weren't particularly happy with and the party moved in a different direction to ha how they envision it. So, and obviously I think that'd be a shame because obviously a lot of us have, you know, done the years with the left in, ch in charge. We've knocked on doors, we've campaigned, etc. cetera. Um, so I just kind of wonder like, what, what is um, their role going forward? Are you hopeful that they'll stick around? Um, but also, my, my other thought, I'm actually reading at the minute, I've got a copy of it here, John O'Farrell's Things Are Going to Get Better. And I'm, I'm at the point in the mid-80s where it's obviously sort of still not great. And I'm just wondering, like, you know, I, I worry if, if, you know, the future, do you think that the left could potentially challenge again in the way that Tony Benn did in 1988? Do you think, you know, the left will kind of, you know, if they're not particularly happy, are they always going to be there for, for a while? Or will it, will it will, you know, how do you think that will sort of pan out? Because obviously this big left-wing membership, will it stick around? What's its future in, in the wider movement? Um, I think that the, um, you know, so I've been a member of the Labour Party now 42 years, and um, I lived through quite a lot of what's in John O'Farrell's book. Uh, I was a member in the uh, Southwark Labour Party in the, in the early 80s, and um, we had some very, very difficult and challenging times there. I think that um, anybody is welcome in the Labour Party that wants to see a Labour Party elected to government, both at local authority level and also at national level. Uh, I, I, I see no point in the Labour Party uh, just sitting at the sidelines sniping, saying we were right. Uh, actually, we need to be in government. And actually, we've often talked about transformative manifestos. That's a big, a big word, isn't it? But actually, there's been very few transformative manifestos in the Labour Party. There was one in 1945, there's one in 1950, one in 1964, in 66, in two in 74, and then 97, 01 and 05. The rest of them have all gone in the bin because we didn't win an election. And so I, I want Labour to be elected. I think that the Labour Party has always been a sort of a collection of people from different sort of opinions who are on the left of British politics. And we're all, we're all of the left. Uh, and that's what, so I think that's always straight in the last years that when people are called right wing, none of us are right wing, we're all the left. We belong, we all belong there. We're all, we're all, so I want people from the progressive left who want to put, um, make people's lives better. And be, make people's lives better is actually delivering clauses around the constitution by getting elected to parliament and get elected to government. So nobody on, if you do a ship shows on, on the hard left or the soft left or, or whatever, the, the party, no, everyone's got a future in the party and we need to work together. There's no one group got the, got every right answer. There's no doubt about it in, that in 2017, the manifesto did actually make progress. There was lots of things there that happened in the that, that, that were, 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 were actually popular and we should re recognise that. So I think that um, no one should be scared of the, whoever the new leader is, that we need to come together, unite together, and we all have to be um, a little bit nicer to each other. As I said, I've, I've been some bloody awful meetings in Lewisham in recent years, and that all needs to stop. So people shouldn't be scared of a new leader, a new direction, because actually the direction is always off the left anyway, and what are we arguing about really? So I think no one should be scared about that. And if you want a progressive Labour Party elected that's going to actually put money in poor people's pockets, going to actually you know, improve the, the, the minimum wage, improve the living wage, improve employment rights, create jobs, get better schools, a better health service, then this is the party. It'd be better on the international stage. This is the party for you. So in that sense, we should all be, so no one should be frightened of that. But we all have to be a bit more respectful of each other. And also, I think, work together a bit more and uh, just toned down some of the criticism we've seen in the last four years. I think the most frustrating thing. 
good. Um, I'm going to call Eduardo next. Uh, there you go. Do you want to fire away, Eduardo? Hello, hello. Um, hi, everyone. Hello, everybody. Um, my question is regarding um, the implementation of supposedly labour tactics in, uh, in a conservative guise. Um, I've got an interest specifically regarding um, how people in the creative industries are being treated. So um, it's been said that the Tories have stolen our colours, but their implementation is just so lackadaisical that it actually makes a mockery of our, of our stances, especially when it comes to equality um, um, and also in terms of uh, making freelancers wait for three months before they, they get anything. And people on benefits are still not getting a, an inflation busting rise, even, even if you add another thousand onto um, whatever people get during the year. So the idea that the Conservatives are going to um, take Labour colours and we're going to not have any ground to stand on is a little bit shaky because of the implementation. That's what I think. Yep, I think what you've highlighted there is how important it is to have an effective opposition. They have made some progress. We've said we're, we think that OK, we've said fine, but equally they need to go much, much further. And you only get that further movement. And you mentioned the creative industries or other people who are working self are self-employed. You only get that further progress, that further moving forward, because the opposition is able to highlight what next needs to be done and is able to garner support for that. So that's why it's so important that the Labour Party in opposition is 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 giving a voice to people who are who, who are not being looked after. And I think we have seen some progress in the government. We will see more when uh, we as a Labour Party set out what we think needs to happen next. And you are right that this, in many cases, the, this help is going to be only available in June and what do people do up till June. And, and beyond that, I suspect that this virus is going to, you know, what, what I read will be around for much, much longer than that. So what happens next? And I think that's the role of the new leader, of the shadow cat, and all, all of us in the Labour Party, whatever, whatever role we play, saying, Yes, fine, that's progress. More needs to happen. This one needs to happen next. And uh, uh, so I think that's what needs to happen. You, you raise a very, very important point there, Eduardo. Brilliant. And the next question, we're going to go back to Milad. Thank you. Um, Roy, just a question about your, uh, your current portfolio for housing um, in the Lords. Um, you touched upon the fact that obviously we need to constructively criticise the government. You're absolutely right. Um, for example, um, something that has come in, which is really welcome, is the new protection uh, for renters not being evicted for the next six months, which you know, I'm sure you can appreciate that, that that's really welcome. And it's given a lot of people security um, in their properties because it's it valued them as, as, as tenants and the fact that they need their homes. You know, it's not just an investment that you can push people around, but it's really sort of pushed the idea that people need their homes for security, shelter and safety. Um, given the fact that following the six months, we're going to come out of this possibly, do you think that we've now taken on a new direction for tenants' rights? Um, moving forward um, and do you think that possibly this might lead to um, no fault evictions being got rid of or could that be a policy idea that we could pursue following this? Um, before the pandemic took hold the government were actually moving uh, on housing there was going to be a housing sort of bill and no fault evictions were going to be um, um, uh, abolished and that, 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 that was good the reason they're, doing, they're going to do that, I believe, though, is that um, although they will, the government will say to you they are a party of home ownership and they want more home, people to own their own home, fine. Um, home ownership has gone down in this country and more and more people, particularly young people, are being forced to live in the private rented sector and that is generally much more expensive than the social rented sector. And that then has created all sorts of problems for people, not being able to save deposits, um, not, not always being able to live, in, you know, in where they want to live and 
create all sorts of other issues for people and things. So I think the government know they've got issues to do with, with, with housing. And I've been pushing very much so that what we need to do is actually build more council housing. And I wrote a piece for a Fabian Review magazine a, probably a year or so ago when I talked about that I grew up on a council estate. And I grew up on a council estate. My mum and dad both worked, but, but the rent was at a rent my mum and dad could afford. Uh, it enabled us to um, be able to go on holiday at least every other year. I remember my dad when he got able to buy a car and there was four, four I'm the oldest of four children, and we had a reasonable sort of standard of living. That's quite hard if you're going to be spending over half your income on your on your rent. You know, so I think that, that there needs to be a new, and so for so, so me, certainly, social housing, council housing, house association, housing association housing at reasonable rent is the way forward. We haven't quite got there yet, the government on that, but they do know there is a problem and they have to find some ways of actually improving that. And they've got various schemes to improve to try and boost home ownership and that's all fine but actually the best way to boost home ownership is let people have a bit more of their own money in their own pockets so they actually then start saving up for deposits and um that's you know where you get to i own my own home now with my wife alicia but i grew up in a council estate my three siblings also own their own homes we, we grew, all grew up in a council estate so there's no, nothing wrong with wanting to become a homeowner it's, it's quite positive but you have to help people along the way and actually making sure the combination they've got at the present time is of a reasonable rent and a reasonable standard is part of that solution. So I think, I think you're right. I think we can, hopefully we'll see um, an understanding from the government how important that is and uh, how the present settlement isn't working for many, many people. And it's particularly acute, I think, in London and the South East. Yeah, particularly, you know, there. But there are problems, of course, in rural areas where there are just not enough properties you know, again, you know, for people to actually live in rural areas and work there. So hopefully it's going to be a new settlement. But again, it's the role of the opposition to constantly pointing out to the government until we become the government, how we actually make our, our society better and giving people a decent place to live. And, and, and social being part of the solution is part of the way forward. Some very good points there. Our next question comes from Martin again. Martin, do you want to give you a question? Yes. Yeah. So, um, Roy, I just wanted to go back to you again on kind of the historical role of the Fabians. As we know, we're on the same committee together, and post-leadership election will be a very crucial time for the party. And just a quick plug to the book I've been reading during um, this isolation period, The First Fabians. It's a really interesting book <laughs> about the lives and times of the first kind of six crucial Fabian members from 1884 to 1914. And they played a huge role in the Labour movement and the foundation of the Labour Party. And I feel that with the new leader, we'll have an opportunity to... Um, we present to the party, to the public, our COVID response will play a huge part in that. But as you mentioned, the Fabian Society being the centre for ideas have always played a, a crucial role. What steps do you think we can do to be helpful? Is it in the form of um, putting out, you know, policy outputs and policy pamphlets, which we have a few in the pipeline, or is it being more vocal and being more clear about where we think the direction the party should be going in. As you know, care is on our committee. Um, you know, is it by embedding, um, you know, a closer relationship between the Fabians and his future leadership team, uh, maybe strengthening a bit more than, you know, compared to what we had with the Corbyn project? And is it getting some Fabian ideas more clearly in the public to not only um, influence the leadership, but influence the wider discourse? Because previously, under the Corbyn leadership, he had his outriders in the media who would go out and push his ideas. You know, do we need to do the same? Do we need to have Fabians on TV, on podcasts? Do we need to create a clear, you know, do what the young Fabians are doing, create a Fabian podcast in a similar way to get some other ideas out there? I just wanted to get your views and your thoughts on how we turn our ideas into a fashion. Yeah, I, I think... Um... The, as you're right, the, the, the role of the Fabian Society in developing policy for the party uh, 
has been really important in the past and, and, and will be again in the future. Um, if Keir Starmer wins, I mean, I think it may be the first time a member of the Fabian EC becomes the leader of the Labour Party. I don't know, but, but it may well be the first time ever. And that's a wonderful thing for us all. Um, I think um, in my role as treasurer, I think we need to raise more money. But I do think that we, have got, we are uniquely paced because I think we've got lots of think tanks want to do work and stuff. But no think tank other than us is affiliated to the Labour Party. We're the only think tank that's got the history we've got with the Labour, with the Labour Party, and we need to build on that. And um, the Labour Party itself, as, as an entity, doesn't really develop much policy. It does rely on the Fabians, it relies on individual thinkers and that, and groups come together. So I think we need to be working very closely with, with, with the new leader, and so hopefully it's Keir, um, and getting from them what they want us to work with them on. So we can look at policy. Is it, you know, we talk about the, uh, you know, a new beverage report. We talked about a policy on housing. How, how are we finally going to tackle the social care crisis? Uh, what's our role in, what's our role in the world going to be, you know, in this new post Brexit world, you know, wh where is our role? Um, what's that going to be? So and all these other really important issues, where are we going to be with education in the next few years? What's going to happen there? You know, so the same thing we need to be looking at our role in terms of criminal justice work and stuff and home affairs work. So I think it's, um, we're uniquely placed to actually do some really detailed policy work. I think we need to try and attract funding from bodies that able to enable us to do that. And then we then need to actually, probably working with hopefully with uh, friends, get more stuff in the media. We're not, we're actually quite good in getting coverage for our New Year conference, for our spring conference. For publications maybe we need to do more things like this or get engaged with other with our commentators so on a much more one-to-one -one basis so we actually get much more general debate about what where we want to go because so i think we've got some really good people in the fabians and really good thinkers really good innovative people and get a much more center stage and where we have got we've got i think if i'm right it's at least a third of the parliamentary party are members of the fabians now so we need much engagement from them we need members of the parliamentary party to see if they good ideas and want to develop things, we should be their first point of call. You know, and uh, we were talking, uh, I did chat with um, Andy uh, and a couple of colleagues a few weeks ago. Maybe we kind of always like, need like uh, a parliamentary Friends of the Fabians to get, you know, we've got, got a few members on the EC, but there's also another sort of like 80 or 90 people in the Fabian society sitting in the House of Commons, even if you, uh, 50 or 60 in, in the House of Lords. How do we engage with them? What, what are they doing? How and what expertise have they got to come in, help our developments? And if they've got ideas for them to see that our, our, our body, our, our social society, their social society is the way forward. So I think maybe we have that discussion on, on, on the EC, Martin, in, in future. And also as treasurer, I need to go out and try and get some more money and convince the people that actually we are the place to develop policy and we're always holding us back is some funds. Uh, to actually know to do that because we do get funds as you know but sometimes our problem with funding at the moment is often it is restricted funds i.e it's from a body and that's very welcome but it's to do x what we need a bit more is unrestricted funds so we can actually then have a have a discussion with the leadership about where we need to go what we need to do and that's what we need to have happen sounds really good there's some really interesting points there i think certainly whoever is elected on saturday give them a lot to think about. I've um, got one final question from Adam. Adam, do you want to take it away? Yeah, thanks Roy. I think uh, it's an interesting discussion to talk about the future of the Fabian Society and its role in policy development for the party and generally as a sort of having a hand on the tiller in the direction of the policy process. Um, you know, there's a couple of things that we're working on as the Young Fabians, which uh, I'm keen to see uh, have, have more uh, have more light in them. Um, one of them is uh, sort of looking at uh, medicinal cannabis and changing the party's policy policy platform on that. You know, we've got something under develop with the help of Martin and a few other people. Uh, uh, the culture war, the apparent disconnect between Labour's supposed base and uh, and its current its current thing. Do you, what role do you think the Young Fabians, uh, our policy networks and members can play in maybe guiding the Fabian Society 
to uh, have more influence within the labour movement. I think, Adam, your, your role is absolutely crucial. The young Fabians, I've said before, you are the future uh, of our society and also the future of our party. I think some of our brightest and smartest thinkers in the Labour Party are members of the young Fabians. Uh, and, you know, as you know, I know, I know and also people like, like Martin, you know, was a, was a leading young Fabian before, you know, so I think we need, we need um, um, as a party and also as a society, understand that and ensure we actually harness that. And how do we as a society, as a, as a society and also as the Labour Party, engage properly with, with, with young, young members and young society members? Because the issues you highlighted there are the thing we have to, have to settle if we're going to move forward, you know. Um, I mentioned social care, huge issue for older people, but I mean, all of us are going to get older, you know, and we, we, have to, we have to settle social care for moving forward. We don't want to be situation in 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years time, we still haven't dealt with the, with the huge, with the social care crisis. Uh, again, the issue made also, Adam, about our, where our support comes from and what, and what we're saying to them. And I think we've seen that with some of our losses in recent years in places unbelievable. We have got a Tory MP in Bolsover and Tory MPs in part of the North East and in Sedgefield and elsewhere. And what went wrong? Why are these places, which are traditional Labour places, voting Tory on the 12th of December 2019? What's gone wrong? And we don't answer that question because what we were saying to them wasn't clearly what they wanted to hear. It wasn't attractive. It wasn't believable. So I think young Fabians have got to be the people who actually guide the, the wider society and, and the wider party in finding those solutions. And if I can help as treasurer to support you doing that, I want to do that and um, get those discussion debates going. I know that Andy said, as John said, wants to do that as well. But it is, you know, honestly, you know, some of the, our smartest thinkers are in the young Fabians. And we need to ensure that you're fully engaged with the new leader's office, with the shadow cabinet and with our parliamentary party. And uh, I said talking about this parliamentary, you know, um, you know, friends of the Fabian side, how do we get those people together to engage with, that, with ourselves? And I, I want to be part of that, making that happen. Thanks, Roy, that was brilliant. Um, so the Zoom talk series continues tomorrow uh, as we have uh, our weekly OK Zoomers. It's a chance for young Fabian members to unwind, uh, talk about the COVID-19 and its effect on all of our lives. It's lighthearted, it's there to vent, it's there for all of us to help with our sort of mental health and, and being able to unload and talk about things because it's, you know, when we're all... I'm a very sociable creature. I love going to the pub. I love going out. I cannot help it. And it's sitting inside for however long is is punishing. Is punishing, and so it's a good opportunity. Yeah, it's a good opportunity for us to. I, I miss the pub. I actually was desperately last night for a, for a bar of fruit and nut. And I, <laughs> I, normally I would go down to the corner shop, but it's shut. <laughs> I need a bar of chocolate. Like go down. I've also started to grow a beard. <laughs> I, I tried. tried. The problem is, you know, it's kind of like ginger on the sides, all white on my chin, and then my hair is another colour. So whether I'll actually have the guts to walk into the House of Lords, I don't know in three weeks' time. But at the moment, at the moment I'm keeping it. You know, you should do. That's it. That's it. Like everyone's got, everyone's got these things. It's just like, how are you coping with it? What are you doing? And everyone. And so we've got Amber Khan, who's our new blog editor. Um, who's going to be hosting it. And then we've got Councillor Mete Coburn uh, from My Life, My Say, who some of you will know. Um, he's going to be hosting it with Amber as a general discussion. And then after people have had a chance to vent, we'll then go into a, well, what does this actually mean for the long term from COVID? You know, what is the change in, in working and what's the change in our economy that we're going to see? And no one has the answers. And maybe there isn't a concrete answer, but there is, you know, we can speculate, we can think, you know, it may be Labour's job in the future to help guide the economy to the structure that's more flexible, that's more secure for workers, that actually looks at key workers as being a large demographic of people that keep our entire food system and other bits working, including adult and young person social care. Um, it, that's, that's it from me. 7pm, uh, check our social media feed for updates on what's going to happen next week. Thank you, Ryan. Marion, did you uh, want to wrap up? 
Yeah, I just want to say thank you very much, Roy, for taking time this evening to chat with us. Some really, really interesting discussion. Hope you all agree. I can see some <laughs> heads nodding at me. So once again, thank you very much, and thank you everyone that took the time to spend this evening with us. Okay, thank you, Mary, and thank you, Adam. You're you know, welcome. it's really great. I think it's a really great series. I come on when I can, but it's really fascinating. It's a really, really good thing to do. Thank you so much. Thank you. Cheers. Keep safe.